what is it you need to do? The big thing is, of course, the currency question. You're absolutely right. It's currency, bond market, debt, being a grown-up country. How do you get there? Well, if you're an MMT fan, it's dead easy. You just print a new thing called the Mick Kilt and you stuff it in the banks and never he'll be fine the next day. Um, I think you can get away with that sort of stuff if you're the United States and you've got the global reserve asset and everybody else basically has to hold it and deal with it. If you're a small economy, Ireland's a good example of this, how come you guys ended up joining the euro? Because it was horrible trying to manage that exchange rate all the time when yep. you're a small open economy. All right? Tiny little moves in the world economy can blow your currency up and down. And if you're heavily dependent on imports and exports, that's a screaming nightmare. So the current account constraint, as economists call it, is a really big deal for small open economies. So what does Scotland do? It's going to have to use the pound for a transitional stage. But then it should be completely open about from day one, this is transitional. This is perhaps a three-year period. You give everybody as investors a chance to adjust their expectations, look at the books, look at the assets, look at the liabilities, and then you say, we're going to get our own currency and we're going to phase it in in three years. How are we going to do that? We're going to float some debt. We're going to try it, see what, it, see what interest rate we'd have to pay if we did this. And in the current environment, when basically any OECD country can borrow 10 to 15 years at a negative real rate, it shouldn't be that much of a big deal. So this is essentially how do you phase a transition in such a way that you don't get capital flight out of the country and you maintain investor confidence and you create a positive buzz about the place so people actually want to invest in it and want to stay there. It's not that difficult to imagine how to do that. No, and the other thing, what I've, what I've looked at, uh, if you look at Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, what you see, uh, and, I've, and, and I put the north of England and large swathes of the, uh, of, the, of the middle of England in this, what you basically see is the progressive emasculation of the innovative power of these regions because mm -hmm. they, nobody's had to do it. They haven't even had to figure out, you know, what sort of tax re regime do we have? How do we get investment in? Totally. How do we... So, but once you actually put that constraint in front of people, it can actually be very energising because you can do to... stuff yourselves. Yeah. You know, we were talking about this earlier, so I don't know if it was captured before we, we started recording, but the whole country lives off the dole generated by London. And, you know, technically what you're looking at is like, you know, GDP, right, gross domestic product. The underlying component that's called GVA, gross value added, right? Which bit adds value so you can flog it further down the chain, right? It used to be that outside of London, there was outside of London, there was a wee bit around Manchester and there was Scotland, which was called GVA positive. For the past decade, it's been London and nothing else. The rest of the country literally lives off transfers. It's kind of like the world's worst universal basic income experiment. Because no, there's I, no I agree with you completely. Obligations and it's shit, and you don't have any real autonomy, and you can't do anything with it, but there you go, that's that. Why would anybody want to stay in that environment? Yes, I love this. This is like the conversation between Spud and Renton in train spotting, except with economics. Remember the original <laughs> conversation? Which, which, which one am I? Well, you're, you're clearly rent. <laughs> you're rent. I'm, I'm just but. But it's like that idea of the Scots realising, shit, we've been conned for years. Well, you can, and you've conned yourself. But for me, I mean, let me clarify this, right? This is not anything that's born out of, ah, was like us, was the bagpipes bollocks, right? It's just simply, the British economy is a joke. Right? It's slowly but surely, it's been revealed to be a giant financial entrepot that clears euros that might not be lasting much longer. Um, the rest of the country is GVA negative. Everybody lives off of transfers. And the bits of the economy that make money are these rentier, rentier sectors that basically add no value, don't do innovation, and just care about sweating assets and getting fees. This is not good. You do not want to be attached to this for the long term. And if you can get out, get out now. When I listen to Nicola Sturgeon, she talks about Denmark, Norway, Sweden, small opening. She talks about Ireland as a lot, a lot as well. But this idea that the Scots could actually just take the blueprint of Denmark and over 20 or 30 years begin to become that sort of society. A runner? Why not? Why not? I mean, really, it's everybody needs a goal. It's an achievable goal. An independent Scotland could become the richest country on earth on a per capita basis. Now I'm not joking when I say that, it has all the necessary ingredients. Now let me explain. Firstly, how do you measure how wealthy a country is on a per capita basis? So we're going to sort of meet somewhere in the middle and use the World Bank's gross national income 
per capita. And that sits somewhere between the, those two other measures. It's flawed, but it will do. Um, now, the UK sits at a rather disappointing 22nd place, but topping the rankings, you have the, right, the likes of Liechtenstein. Uh, Bermuda doesn't actually count uh, because it's not a, a country. Switzerland, Norway, Macau and the Isle of Man don't count. Luxembourg, Iceland, very impressive from Iceland. The Channel Islands, they don't count. The US, Qatar, Qatar Denmark, Ireland and Singapore. Now, some of these nations have got there thanks to their oil. Norway and Qatar, for example. Iceland doesn't have oil, but it does have um, lots of cheap energy. But oil isn't everything. And others have got onto that tom top ten list because they're financial or commercial centres. Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore, for example. But the same regulatory options that have enabled these countries to be what they are, are open to other countries. They just haven't been adopted. But there is, however, one characteristic which is common to all of the top 10 ranking nations, bar one. And it is that they are small. Singapore, Norway, both have populations around 5 million, Qatar, 3 million, Luxembourg is around half a million, <laughs> Liechtenstein's population isn't even 40,000. And this is because there is a direct correlation between the size of the state and the wealth of the people. The bigger the former, the smaller the latter. The bigger the state, the poorer the people. The more power is concentrated, the less wealth is spread. But in a small nation forced to live from a smaller tax base, there's more of a limit to how big state institutions can grow. Monitoring becomes more efficient, it's harder to obfuscate, so there's more transparency and accountability and less waste. Change is easier to implement in smaller organisations, which makes the nation more flexible, more dynamic, more competitive. With fewer people, there's less of a wealth gap between those at the top and the bottom. So, back to Scotland. Scotland now has the opportunity, if it votes for independence, to enact the same legislation, taxation and regulation that the other top ten countries on that list employ, following, say, I don't know, the blueprint of Singapore or even Iceland. It already has a rich tradition in trade, in finance and banking, and it has the oil. And with just five million people, it's small. It has all the ingredients to be the richest country on earth on a per capita basis. It has the triple. I can think of no other nation in the world with such a wonderful opportunity. The same people who asked me the question that I addressed recently about whether Scotland could afford to be independent, to which I gave the quite emphatic answer of yes, asked me a follow-up question which I want to address in this video. And that was, will Scotland be better or worse off as an independent country than it is in the UK now? Now, to me, that is a more relevant question than the one about whether Scotland can afford to be independent, because quite simply, Scotland can afford to be independent because every other state of similar size and history around the world that is independent is doing quite well. But why could Scotland do better than the UK? What, that's the real question, the one on which people want to have confidence. And my answer is this. Every country that is going to become independent wants to have something on which it can pin its fortunes. And my belief is that Scotland can pin its future fortunes on the basis of the fact that it has got the access to the most phenomenal renewable resources, probably the greatest intensity of them per head of population in Europe as a whole. It has a larger tidal reach and one that can be captured than any other country in Europe. It has access, you might say disadvantage from that, but access to a lot of wind power. It actually doesn't do too badly on solar power at some parts of the year as well. And remember, not every type of renewable energy has to be effective all the time.
So Scotland has that bedrock on which it can build independence because it has something that the rest of the world wants. It used to be oil and now it's renewable energy. Is that a sufficient basis for becoming a country in your own right? Well, no, but Scotland has got lots of other things too. A great education system, a foundation of good quality law and a principle of upholding it. And of course, independent of England already, and therefore unadulterated by any changes that take place, a continuation will be there. It has got a strong experience in civil service administration. It is good at that process and has supplied many senior civil servants to the rest of the UK. It has a strong, powerful and open-minded approach to its political history, which has given rise to change which would be surprising in other countries. It is able to sustain the ideas that underpin this. Has it got other industries of note? Well, look, it actually has quite a good agricultural sector. It has got some strong export industries like whiskey, which will have to overcome problems with the EU, but I'm sure will. It has got products which are notable. It could create its own financial services sector again, which was once vibrant and located in Edinburgh. And I see no reason why that may not happen once more, particularly given the decline in UK financial services and the relative loss of confidence in them as a result of Brexit. It could, of course, if it was to be readmitted to the EU, take advantage of that situation as the UK used to, as being the gateway hub to Europe in some ways that might be quite advantageous, particularly if it has its own but non-EU currency, which will give it a competitive advantage over Ireland, for example. All these things suggest to me that Scotland, together with its broad-minded approach to immigration, which is going to guarantee sufficient people to sustain itself and its population as they age, are the foundation for a strong, stable community, which I do not see in the rest of the UK, which is, I'm afraid to say, deeply narrow-minded, opposed to migration, willing to put impediments in progress to all sorts of business activity for the sake of prejudice, and which therefore is not a good long-term partner for Scotland anymore not least because, most critically, the UK seems to be quite willing to undermine the value of its currency and Scotland could therefore thrive in comparison to the rest of the UK by actually having a currency which is based upon its intrinsic value as a trading nation, which might well be stronger for that than the UK as a whole. Do I therefore believe Scotland could be better off than the UK after independence? Yes. Do I think on balance of probabilities it will be? I think there's a significant chance of that. Would I be willing to take that risk in that situation? Undoubtedly, because I believe Scotland has everything going for it with one final twist I'd like to mention. And that is evidence shows that once you liberate people to take control of their own, own destinies, that's precisely what you do. You release a burst of energy, a flourish of entrepreneurship, a skill set that was previously almost unrecognised that you can tap into and develop and deliver upon. And that's what I think Scotland will also do, which the rest of the UK appears to have, well, nothing equivalent to. And in that case, again, I go back to it. Can Scotland be better off? Yes, without a doubt. Now, the Scottish contribution to the world, whether it's in engineering, invention, industry, finance, has been astounding. Think. Adam Smith, Alexander Fleming, John Logie Baird, James Watt. You can't doubt Scottish talent. They're a formidable people, but they don't dominate the global stage as they once did. Um, there'd be an incredibly tough period of adjustment to get through, but an independent Scotland living off its tax base with dynamism, self-belief restored, they can be great once again. And one last thing I'll say about the sort of the, the Scottish move, it, what also pushed me over is just looking at the polls in terms of dem demography. If you look at anybody under the age of 50, it's overwhelming majority. And it just gets more and more extreme the further back you go. So I look at it this way, this is priced in. This is going to happen. It's just a question of when. So if you know it's going to happen, the, th the reasonable thing to do is to do it as well as you can.